is nothing that is about the victim. The victim doesn't exist. This is how Celeste's mother, Aggie, feels about losing her daughter to a deranged monster. All of it has been shocking and it's just wrong. On November 16th, 2020, 23-year-old Celeste Mano's life was brutally cut short in Melbourne, Australia. Her murder at the hands of a former co-worker who had become obsessed with her shocked the nation and highlighted the grave dangers of stalking. Lue Sacco had terrorized Celeste for over a year. His letter-long messages had gotten more threatening by the week, and his threats escalated to the point where he was in his car, parked, watching Celeste inside her home for hours on end. And yet the authorities sent Celeste and her mom home. And when they finally decided to look into the case, they did not do merely enough to stop Sacco. Only when it was too late did people come together to discuss what they should have done. Sadly, this happens one too many times in the tragic stories we cover. But Celeste's case is unique and her story must be told. In her honor, let's see how we can stay safe from monsters like Lue Sacco and how her family is coping today. This is the tragic story and sickening story of Celeste Mono. In the early hours of November 16th, 2020, 35-year-old Lue Sacco broke into Celeste Mano's family home in Mernanda, a suburb of Melbourne. He shouldn't have known where she lived. He shouldn't have even had her phone number, and he wasn't allowed to be there. She'd filed a restraining order against him. Armed with a hammer and a large kitchen knife, Sacco smashed through Celeste's bedroom window and launched a vicious attack. In a horrifying span of two and a half minutes, he stabbed Celeste 73 times with one strike to her heart proving fatal. Two and a half minutes sounds like a short time in most contexts, but imagine taking this long to die at the hands of someone you hate, someone you'd been trying to get away from for over a year. Celeste's mom, Aggie Dioro, was awakened by the sound of shattering glass. In a heartbreaking account, she described the moment. It was like something I just never heard. It was like Mil a million pieces of glass just crashing and all of a sudden I, I heard oh so I remember just going Celeste and I just ran out of bed and I'm just screaming her name down the hallway I'm going Celeste sweetie what happened and I realized that I'm running all over glass I'm seeing blood I still don't get it and I'm pulling her out of the bed she's not helping me at all but I see all that glass and so I thought I didn't want to drop her on all that Aggie rushed to her daughter's aid but it was too late the attack was swift and brutal leaving no chance for survival as paramedics arrived they found a devastated Aggie trying to desperately to save her daughter. Breathe, sweetie, please don't leave me, don't leave me. And then one of them stops me and he says, this is a crime scene, we found a knife. And in that moment, all I said was, what? Oh my God, he killed her. He said, you know who did this? I said, yeah. <laughs> The murder occurred just hours after Celeste had posted a photo online with her new boyfriend, Chris Ridsdale. This seemingly innocent act of sharing happiness became the trigger for Sacco's deadly obsession. I couldn't have asked for a, for a better last day to have with Celeste. That beautiful photo. What are you thinking and feeling in that photo? Just happy. Just in, in every sense of the word, Celeste was just so adamant that it would be my new profile picture on Instagram. Um, and that she couldn't wait to put it up. The immediate police response to the crime was swift. Security footage from outside the house showed Sacco fleeing in his car as paramedics arrived. In a shocking turn of events, Sacco drove directly to a police station and turned himself in, leaving the murder weapon behind at the scene. He told the officer, you know what happened? It's your fault. She's dead. She's dead. Go have a look. Who the hell does something like this, leaves the murder weapon behind, drives to a cop station. I said, Jesus Christ, mark my words, he's going to try and get off on mental impairment. The police quickly charged Sacco with murder, but the story was only getting started and a long list of sickening details would emerge, ending with Sacco's sentence. 
There was nothing not to love about Celeste. In 2020, Celeste was 23 years old. Everyone who knew her spoke highly of her. They were sure she had a promising future ahead of her, and she had that type of energy that influenced others. When Celeste's loved ones were in the same room as her, they felt a bit more optimistic about their futures too. In a way, this is what makes this case extra tragic. Celeste was looking forward to so many things. She was so beautiful. Well, I think so. I spent 23 years letting her know how blessed I was. Aggie would let her daughter know she loved her in every way, and she marveled at what a special person she'd grown up to be. Celeste would always tell her mom she only said that because she was her mom. She was modest like that, and everybody loved her for it, even those she wanted nothing to do with. In her professional life, Celeste worked at a call center where she was respected and well-liked by her colleagues. She was known for her kindness and professionalism, traits that ironically led her to her first interaction with Louie Sacco. Never ever did it occur to me that this beast would be capable of something like this. Celeste Lue and Chris Risdale all worked at the same Melbourne call center back in 2020. But while Celeste only had a few minutes of small talk with Lue, she and Chris hit it off. Soon, he would become her boyfriend. When Celeste was taken from this earth, her relationship with Chris was just blooming, making the tragedy all the more heart-wrenching. She chose you. You say you were lucky. Yes, because time with her was just was just always amazing when she was smiling you could see it from a mile away and she always just lit up and her laugh was infectious when she got going Celeste had dreams and aspirations like many other 23-year-olds do. She was at the beginning of her adult life with a world of possibilities ahead of her and she was excited about her future. She had a right to be. Louise Sacco, 35 at the time of the murder, was a former colleague of Celeste's at the call center where they both worked. Their interaction was brief and professional, with Celeste having little to do with Sacco beyond their work environment. The events that would lead to the tragic outcome began in June 2019, when Sacco was fired from his position as a team leader at the call center. As a part of her job responsibilities, Celeste had the task of escorting Sacco out of the building on his last day. This brief interaction seemed seems to have been the catalyst for Sako's obsession. Celeste's mother recalled her daughter mentioning this incident. Uh, somewhat upset because she goes, I really felt bad for him, so I just extended my hand to wish him all the best. She goes, and he plants a kiss on my cheek, Mum. I must have gone to Mido Red. I was so embarrassed. And I said, oh, you're such a drama queen, sweetie. He's probably had a crush on you all along and you haven't even realized. At the time, Aggie tried to reassure her daughter. Little did they know that this seemingly innocuous incident would be the beginning of a nightmare. A few days after being fired, Sako contacted Celeste on Instagram. What started as a single message quickly escalated into an avalanche of unwanted attention. Celeste's mother described the progression. She goes, Mom, have a guess who's just messaged me? I said, who? She's the guy I told you about the other day, the one that left my work. And then from there, is how it all started. This was one of his messages to her. I'm sorry, but I can't stop thinking about you. I have never felt like this about anybody in my entire life. It's bordering along OCD. I'm totally infatuated with you, captivated and fascinated by you. You're all I think about. After leaving you, my productivity and my personal life in my new job has been impacted. This obsession with you, which is a crush, is an addictive and destructive feeling that is interfering with my ability to concentrate, deal with others, and go about my daily routine. Yeah. By the way, he did not leave her, he left the job after getting fired. Also, before you ask yourself, no, Celeste was not flattered. It is not flattering to receive invasive, unwanted attention like this. It is downright scary. Some of them almost were like poetry. And there's just heaps of these messages. And so I said, oh my God. They're all about how crazy in love he is with her. He can't eat, sleep, he can't function. He can't even look for work. Celeste took the first logical step and she asked him to stop texting her. Stop contacting me as this is making me very uncomfortable. Please respect my wishes and stop. Despite Celeste's attempt to ignore and even block Sako, he persisted. He would create new Instagram accounts each time Celeste blocked him, sometimes within minutes of being blocked. Chris Ridsdale, Celeste's boyfriend, described 
described the relentless nature of the stalking. Sometimes it was within a matter of minutes. She blocked an account, closed her phone, reopened it again half an hour later. There was a new message request from a new random username and it had come from him. He just wouldn't give up? Wouldn't, wouldn't at all. It was painful to watch Celeste go through it. The way she stressed over it, the way she lost sleep, the way she felt in every way uncomfortable about the situation. The content of Sako's messages became increasingly concerning. What started as declarations of love evolved into more explicit and threatening content. Aggie described some of the later messages as the most vulgar things she had ever read. This guy knows where you work, okay? We don't know who he is and what he wants. The last thing we need is for him to find out where you live. And she goes, that's crazy. Gosh, mum, I'm sure he's just going to get bored. But Sako did not get bored, and the messages were only getting worse. He says, I'm going to climb up and show the world that I am somebody. It was just the way it was written. And so I said to her, Celeste, he's clearly not getting bored. He's not going away. After six months of continuous harassment, Celeste and her mother decided to seek help from authorities. They went to the police to report Sako's behavior. However, their initial experience was disappointing. Aggie recounted their first visit to the police station. He hasn't committed a crime. There's nothing we can do about it. He looked at Celeste and he said, well, just ignore it. She goes, I have been ignoring. And then he said, you know, that's social media these days. If you don't like it, get off social media. This response left Celeste and her mother feeling helpless and unprotected. Aggie couldn't even remember if the officer took notes or Sako's name during the visit. It seemed like in many of the tragic true crime stories we cover, that authorities were siding with the predator. Despite this setback, Celeste continued to document the harassment. The situation escalated when Sako was seen parked outside her workplace and began following her, eventually figuring out where she she lived. And from a parked car in front of her house, Sako was sending Celeste vulgar, threatening texts. Aggie still shudders at the thought of someone seeing her beloved daughter that way. And it was in the most vulgar. I've never read something like that. But he didn't. After six months, Celeste and Aggie had to do something. They went to the police. She didn't want to go to the police. This particular message he'd sent, that was no longer one of his love messages. This sounded like an angry message. What did it say? He says, I'm going to climb up and show the world that I am somebody. It was just the way it was written. And so I said to her, Celeste, he's clearly not getting bored. He's not going away. And when you walk into the police station, what do they say to you? He hasn't committed a crime. There's nothing we can do about it. He looked at Celeste and he said, well, just ignore it. She goes, I have been ignoring. And then he said, well, you know, that's social media these days. If you don't like it, get off social media. Did they take his name? Did they indicate they might talk to him? I don't even remember him taking notes. Nothing. Nothing was done to stop Seiko messaging Celeste. And for the next six months, it just got worse. Seiko was seen parked outside her work. He started following her and figured out where she lived. This had gone on for an entire year. After a year of continuous stalking, Celeste and Aggie returned to the police. This time, they encountered a different officer who took their concerns seriously. Aggie recalled the officer's response. And I said, yes, actually six months ago. Are you telling me something should have been done then? He said, let's just say some of us do our job better than others. Sure, except this job is one of the few that can save people's lives. The stakes are pretty high when someone comes into your station to report a stalker. It's heartbreaking that there are officers out there who don't take this seriously. This officer helped Celeste obtain a personal safety intervention order against Sako. This legal document prohibited Sako from contacting Celeste in any way. For a brief period, it seemed to work. The stalking stopped and Celeste and her family felt a sense of relief. However, Aggie still felt that lingering sense of dread, the kind that told her Sako would not stop forever. This is just a piece of paper, sweetie. Let's remember that. 
for a month, the piece of paper worked. Sadly, Aggie was right. A month after the intervention order was issued, Sacco breached it by sending Celeste a three-page letter on Instagram. In this letter, he pleaded with her to withdraw the order and stop the charges against him for stalking and harassment. Please see reason, Celeste. Please, Celeste, the ball is in your court. Only you can end this now, Celeste. Please end this nonsense by withdrawing the order and stopping the charges against me for stalking and harassment. And if you make the right choice, Celeste, both of us can move on and we can finally have peace of mind. So he's breached the order now. Gosh, I can't believe he breached it. The police acted and charged Seiko. It was a moment of relief for Aggie and Celeste. This breach of the intervention order led to Sacco being charged by the police. Once again, Celeste and her family thought this might finally be over. It was over. Tragically, they were wrong. Sako was the type of monster who goes even more berserk when he feels rejected. And this was the strongest rejection from Celeste yet. The case of Celeste Mano starkly illustrates the dangerous progression from unwanted attention to deadly obsession. What began as seemingly harmless messages quickly escalated into a pattern that made Celeste feel unsafe and violated. Obsessive behavior like Sako's often seems like a misguided sense of entitlement or a failure to accept rejection. In Sako's case, a brief professional interaction was twisted in his mind into something much more significant. Despite clear signals from Celeste that his attention was unwanted, he persisted, believing he had a right to her time and attention. If someone keeps contacting you even after you've asked them to stop, that's a big red flag. It gets even more concerning if they start making new social media accounts to message you after you've blocked them. Pay attention to their messages if they become more intense over time, or if what started as love talk turns into explicit or threatening messages. It's also really worrying if they try to dig up personal info about you, like where you live or work. Physical stalking, like them showing up in places uninvited, is definitely not okay. And if it's gotten to the point where there are legal orders involved and they ignore those, that's super serious. Remember, these behaviors aren't normal or romantic. They're dangerous. If you notice any of these things happening to you or a friend, it's important to tell a trusted person and get help right away. Your safety matters, and you have the right to feel secure and respected. It's it's crucial to understand that this type of behavior is not romantic or flattering. It's a form of harassment that can have severe psychological impacts on the victim and, as in Celeste's case, could potentially escalate to physical violence. And he did this under my watch. That's something I have to live with. Sadly, Celeste did everything right, and yet it was still not enough to keep her safe. While we must remember not to blame Celeste or any victim, her tragic case offers valuable lessons on how to protect oneself from stalkers and obsessive individuals. First off, trust your gut. If someone's behavior creeps you out, take that feeling seriously. Don't be afraid to set clear boundaries. Tell them straight up that their attention is not welcome and they need to back off. Keep a record of everything screenshots, emails, the works. It might come in handy later. Remember, Celeste and Aggie documented every disgusting message that Sako had sent. And when they took them to the police a second time, they were taken seriously. Also, lock down your social media accounts and be careful about what personal info you're putting out there. Let your friends, family, and maybe even your boss know what's going on so that they can have your back. Don't wait around hoping it'll get better. Report stalking behavior to the authorities ASAP. If the first person you talk to doesn't take you seriously, ask for someone who does, or reach out to victim support service. A restraining order might be worth considering too. Stay alert when you're out and about and try to switch up your routine if you can. There are some cool apps out there for personal safety, but remember, stalkers might use tech to track you too. Lastly, don't try to handle all this stress on your own. Talking to a counselor or joining a support group can really help. Remember, your safety and peace of mind are super important, and there are people out there ready to help you. Remember, stalking is a crime, and you have the right to feel safe. Never blame yourself for someone else's behavior. Prepare myself for what was going to happen next. 
But now this broken mum has become an expert. The legal process following Celeste's murder was long and painful for her family. The case was in and out of court for three painstaking years. During this time, Sacco attempted to use mental impairment as a defense, just as Aggie had predicted he would. However, after failing to convince psychiatrics of his mental impairment, Sacco finally pleaded guilty to murdering Celeste. The court proceedings revealed the premeditated nature of his crime. It came to light that Sacco had purchased the knife used in the attack the day after Celeste reported his breach of the intervention order. On February 29, 2024, more than three years after the murder, Sacco was finally sentenced. And you decided otherwise. Sacco was sentenced to a maximum of 36 years in prison with a non-parole period of 30 years. The sentence, while substantial, left Celeste's family feeling that justice had not fully been served. Aggie expressed her frustration with the outcome. Proves just how flawed the justice system is. Chris Ridsdale, Celeste's boyfriend, also found the outcome devastating. The fact that Celeste had to go through it for as long as she did was a crime in itself. And things could have been done so much sooner before they had escalated to the point that they did. And her dad, Tony, could only say how much he regretted not being there to protect his daughter when she needed him most. I should have protected her. It haunts me. It's going to haunt me to the rest of my life. What did you want coming here today? Just justice. Just, just justice. Celeste had dreams like any other 23-year-old. That he killed her, that stalker, that guy who wouldn't leave her alone. He smashed in the window and he killed her. It's beyond heartbreaking. It, it kills you to relive that on her behalf and try and understand what she must have gone through. The loss of Celeste has left an inedible mark on her family and loved ones. Her mother, Aggie, carries the pain of her loss every day. She keeps a golden heart filled with Celeste's ashes close to her all the time, a poignant reminder of the daughter she lost. With living without Celeste, I needed to understand exactly what was to come. And the more I was learning, the angrier I was becoming. Our legislation in so many areas is just wrong. There is nothing that is about the victim. The trauma of that night continues to affect Aggie deeply. She relives the horrific moments of discovering her daughter, running through the broken glass, and desperately trying to save her. These memories are a constant source of pain and anguish. Celeste's father and her brother, Alessandro, have also been profoundly affected by her loss. The family unit has been forever changed with an irreplaceable void left by Celeste's absence. She was just my, she was just my world. Just my world. How much fight have you got left in you? Chris Ridsdale, who had just begun a relationship with Celeste, was left to grapple with the sudden and violent loss of someone he cared for deeply. The photo they took together on their last date, which inadvertently triggered Sacco's final act of violence, now serves as a bittersweet reminder of what could have been. In the wake of the tragedy, Celeste's family, particularly her mother, Aggie, has channeled their grief into advocacy for change. They are determined to ensure that Celeste's death is not in vain and that other families might be spared similar heartbreak. With the laws the way they are. Aggie has become a vocal advocate for reforming stalking laws and improving the response to stalking cases. She has educated herself on the legal system and has been outspoken about its failings. The family's advocacy has led to increased public awareness about the dangers of stalking and the need for systemic changes. Recognize what stalking is and use the word stalking. If you go to the police, say stalking. If you're talking about it with family, use the word stalking. Call this what it is. It's its own behavior that causes its own kind of damage and it needs its own response. So Celeste's family isn't just sitting back. They're fighting for some real changes to make things safer for everyone. They want the cops to crack down harder when someone breaks an intervention order. That's like a legal stay away command. They're also pushing for police to get better training on how to handle stalking cases. Because let's face it, some officers just don't get how serious this stuff is. They want more help for people who are being stalked. Not just legal stuff, but emotional 
emotional support too. And if someone does ignore that intervention order, Celeste's family wants them to face some seriously tough consequences. Lastly, they're all about stopping this stuff before it gets out of hand. They want better ways to spot the warning signs early on and step in before things turn dangerous. It's all about making sure what happened to Celeste doesn't happen to anyone else. Pretty cool that they're taking their pain and using it to try to make the world a little safer, right? Aggie has been particularly vocal about the need for the justice system to prioritize the rights and safety of victims. She believes that the current system often fails to adequately protect those who are being stalked, leaving them vulnerable to escalating violence. Celeste Mano's death, the government's response to the VLRC report. I've had cases that I've worked with where victims have literally had to kind of, you know, change their name, move into state. You know, their whole life is upended. It's enormously destructive. We just need to do, we need to do better, fundamentally. I know that the system failed that family. Celeste's tragic death brought to light several systemic issues in how stalking cases are handled. One, initial police response. The dismissive response Celeste received when first reporting the stalking highlights a need for better training among law enforcement officers. All reports of stalking should be taken seriously and thoroughly investigated. Two, intervention order enforcement. Despite having an intervention order in place, Saka was able to continue his harassment. This points to a need for stricter enforcement and consequences for breaching these orders. Mental health considerations. While mental health issues should be considered in legal proceedings, Celeste's case highlights the need for balance that doesn't compromise victim safety. For victim support, there's a pressing need for more comprehensive support for stalking victims, including counseling, safety planning, and legal assistance. In response to Celeste's case and others like it, the Victorian government initiated some changes. One, the Victorian Law Reform Commission launched an inquiry into the state's stalking laws in 2021. A new assessment tool called SASH, Screening Assessment for Stalking and Harassment, was introduced to help police identify high-risk stalking cases. However, progress has been slow. Jocelyn Sims, Victoria's Attorney General, acknowledged the need for change, but also the complexity of the issue. And the early signs are that it's good. I'll have you, be having conversations. Early signs. We're four years in. It's a pilot who's identifying concerning behaviour that can amount to stalking, um, and so therefore... And finally, guess why Louis Sacco only got 36 years behind bars? So it worked. His mental impairment defense worked, albeit partially. Imagine how Celeste's loved ones feel, knowing justice sided with the villain once again. Aggie swears she will fight for the rest of her life to see Sacco rot in prison. She made a promise to her daughter that she would get justice for her. To believe that laws can't change. In honor of Celeste and all victims of stalking, it's crucial that we continue to push for change, raise awareness, and create a society where everyone can feel safe and respected. Remember, stalking is never acceptable, and help is available. If you or someone you know is experiencing stalking, reach out to local authorities, victim support services, or trusted adults for help. Your safety and well-being are paramount, and you have the right to live free from fear and harassment. Hey, thanks for watching. What are your thoughts on this tragic case? Do you know similar stories you'd like me to cover? Let me know in the comment section, and before you leave, you know the drill. Like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. See you soon, and stay safe.